James Ernest here with Brandon Sneed, author and uh, reporter, wanted to uh, cover your new book. So, Brandon, tell us about your new book. All right, it's uh, called Heads in the Game, the mental engineering of the world's greatest athletes. Uh, Day Street, the HarperCollins imprint put it out. And um, it's basically just about this kind of, you know, I call it a hidden revolution, and I'm not one to exaggerate, And uh, but revolution was really the only word that, you know, succinctly summed it up uh, with athletes doing all kinds of cutting-edge stuff, um, using a lot of deep science, some of it really old science and old technology and methods, some of it very, very new, uh, to make their minds better uh, in many ways by directly dealing with the physical brain. And uh, it was it's been a few years of just uh, my mind being blown <laughs> on a weekly basis. Uh, so it's been really fun, and I'm just really excited it's out now. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned in the uh, intro that uh, possibly by the time your kids read the book that uh, this might not be the most up-to-date stuff anymore. Do you feel that's a legit possibility? Yeah, as far as, you know, the technology and uh, maybe some of the methods, it's like anything, it's like, you know, lifting weights or whatever, uh, I mean, and exercise and, you know, TV, I mean, because a lot of it is very tech-based. So I'm sure that it's going to evolve technologically into God only knows what. But um, but that said, I think that the core concepts, the core science, and the core ideas are all uh, pretty much going to be the same. Um, that was kind of how I put it together was, look, I mean, this stuff is probably going to evolve, you know, as far as what sort of form it takes. But what it's going to be doing is basically the same. And... Um, yeah, and that was just, the, you know, I'm sure it will be different when my kids are old enough to actually care about it. <laughs> but, you know, I still think that the book itself, you know, like I kind of say, hopefully explain a lot of stuff to them. Nice. So, like, the concepts, the theories behind it are long-term. It's just the individual applications might uh, might change over the years, I guess. Yeah, I mean, well, like, for instance, you know, this all kind of became possible, you know, about two decades ago, you know, until then, uh, you know, we kind of assumed, by we, I mean, you know, people in general, but especially even scientists, you know, smartest neuroscientists in the world, pretty much believed that who we were just as people uh, was pretty much set in stone by the time we were adults, right? Like, uh, you know, by the time you're in your 20s, you know, your brain is pretty much hardwired. And then a uh, rogue neuroscientist, Michael Mertnich, he kind of threw all that on its head. Uh, he it was started with him doing some experiments on some monkeys and watching their brains physically change, which just he saw completely by accident. And um, from there, I mean, it was off to the races. It took him a long time to prove this to people. When he first introduced it to his colleagues and wrote a paper about it actually several decades ago, he, you know, he got mocked and called a liar and everybody thought he was crazy. And he kept at it. And I mean, now it's, you know, you know, it, it, a lot of people say stuff they're doing can change the world because, you know, maybe it can if enough people do it because technically that will be true. But, like, this changes the way you look at the world because it changes the way we look at people. You know, it's like, we can change. Um, nobody's stuck. And uh, it's not always easy, but it's incredibly powerful to watch, you know, the brain physically literally change. That is amazing. Yeah, you're right. I mean, most of the major scientists in history were mocked at the time when they came up with their ideals, but then nowadays, you know, uh, shoot, I'll go with the cheap one of the earth is round. I mean, for the longest time, people, yeah, always thought, no, it's flat. And now yeah. I mean, we couldn't, you know, couldn't be shocked, you know, when people, you know, that, that they thought that back in the day. Yeah, I mean, it was because really, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist journalist it's not like I, i'm a storyteller i love great stories that's why i do this and you know that's why i was really glad like i had to go so far down the science rabbit hole to make sure you understand this because you know i needed to get it right but it was really just about the story of you know you know athletes you know now because they're starting to use this like this has been used in the medical world and a lot of this has been used in like intensely psychiatric worlds and bubbles and that kind of thing for a long time now but you know, it's starting to, you know, with athletes especially, like, they have a chance to, you know, kind of, you know, lead the way. I mean, people follow athletes. They follow sports, you know. I mean, it's, uh, and that's not always a bad thing, I don't think, especially with something like this. I mean, some of the best athletes in the world are, you know, some of them are hooking their brains up to, you know, electrodes that are connected to computers that read their brain waves that then show them how their brain is functioning. And then they're using that same stuff to 
to then train their brains and make it better. I mean, it's like really crazy far out stuff, but they're doing it because they see it working. It's literally changing their brain. And um, if you can imagine, like, you know, you look around the world, it seems to get crazier every day right now. You imagine people not necessarily connecting their brains to computers all the time, but just taking, you know, a chance to, you know, look at their own mind and stuff and be willing to sort of sort it out. You know, I think it could really just, you know, make everybody's lives a little easier. Exactly. I mean, worst case scenario, at least starting on the basic level of, like you mentioned, how athletes, uh, it's now commonplace for uh, psychologists to be a part of uh, their training system, where, you know, unfortunately still in normal culture, it's considered, it has a stigma against it, you know, oh, you got to be crazy if you have a psychologist, but, you know, now, you know, it's very important for us to have mental and physical health, so yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, every, you know, that's one of the coolest things I learned doing this is, I mean, multiple people told me, that, you know, they're in this world. I mean, every great athlete, you know, every, they all talk to a therapist or a psychologist or someone like that, you know, every month, if not every week, if not every day, you know, especially in, like, intense times during the season or whatever. And, um, but even then, you know, because when I was first going into this book, like, I knew a bunch of who those guys were, and I was going to, you know, kind of tell their stories to illustrate all these other you know, deep concepts and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they all kind of change their minds and kind of shied away once they realized how deep I wanted to go with it. Um, because, you know, I just want to be able to understand it. And, um, and they just, uh, you know, it was just like this deeply uncomfortable thing for them to talk about publicly. And, you know, on one hand, I get that, um, you know, but it's just, it's really wild. Like one, one of these, uh, neuroscientists who works with a lot of them put it to me like this. He said, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know how the world of sports is, uh, when it comes to, you know, they're not always the most progressive uh, with social issues and such. And he even said, you know, it's probably easier for, you know, a male pro athlete, you know, on the elite level to come out as gay now than to, like, admit that they are talking to psychologists all the time. Even though, like, it's still, like, we know that they have sports psychologists, but they're not going to sit there and talk about their therapy sessions, you know. And um, that kind of really says it all, but... uh, in that world, though, it's normal. It's very normal for them to be talking to those people all the time. So what type of new levels of performance do you feel we're going to be able to achieve with this? That I am or that athletes are? That athletes, yeah, that athletes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think we still, you know, we're just going to, I mean, you look at, you know, what happened with the, you know, the Super Bowl. I mean, Matt Ryan, you know, he's been doing a lot of this stuff and, um, you know, different different, you know, games and technologies and stuff he's been using. And, and I mean, it really, they, it showed up with the Falcons this year. I mean, and then, you know, Tom Brady did what he did in the second half. And, you know, he also does a lot of this stuff. He's really, you know, geeked out on it. And, um, I mean, that's just an example. I guess I just think we're going to keep seeing, I mean, just more amazing stuff in sports. It's hard to really say something concrete because, you know, unless they're going to, like, lay out, the, uh, you know, the statistics of all their, you know, brain training, you know, whatever they're doing, it's going to be hard to really nail yeah. that down. But I just think we're going to see this become more and more normal, and I think that's going to, we're going to see a lot, just a lot smarter approach to sports all around. It's not going to be this, like, almost militaristic thing. <coughs> everything out and being tough. I think we're just going to see a lot more smart, smart stuff going on in sports. So kind of like what uh, James Harrison does with his body, where he reinvests with the uh, the oxygen chambers and those type of things. You're going to see more athletes, I guess, doing this and investing into their brain. Yeah, I really do. I mean, I really think it's it, right now it's kind of following the same track as we saw with, you know, if you look at a few decades ago, like I found all these old newspaper articles. The magazine articles and all that going on about how weird it was that athletes were starting to lift weight and how weird it was that they were starting to, like, go swimming in the off season and all this stuff and like to get in shape. Like it used to be weird to get in shape in the off season. It was just, you just show up for spring training or whatever, if you're a baseball player and get in shape over a few weeks and, you know, go from there. I mean, it's just, it used to be, you know, just if you're a naturally good athlete, you're a naturally good athlete. If not, oh well. And guys used to get fined for lifting weights and, you know, training in the off season. And now that obviously sounds crazy. Um, so I really, you know, and, and teams have, you know, their own gyms and all their facilities and stuff. And so I really think that we're going to see, it's just all of this different stuff become more and more integrated into their culture and their facilities. And I mean, you know, in 10 years, I mean, you'll have a gym in one corner of the facility and you'll have, you know, all this, you know, brain training, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, 
another corner. How many different brain types are there out there? Because you mentioned in the book there's different brain types. Different brain types? Yeah. Is it just the two? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, what, uh, you talking about that chapter, two very different brains? Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that was basically just referring to you know the you know there's the athletes that seem to have this preternatural ability to just stay completely calm and focused under pressure even if they're having a terrible game. I mean, I used uh, Russell Wilson in, in that chapter as an example of that. He had a horrible game, and like I think it was a 2015 NFC Championship game. I think is the one I write about in there. And, you know, no touchdowns through four interceptions. Um, and he, you know, then leads this comeback in the final minutes, takes him to overtime, throws, like, I think two touchdowns to tie and then win the game. And, uh, you know, it was just remarkable. You know, you can have this horrible game um, and still come back and do that against some of the, like, scariest, fastest, strongest men in the world trying to tear your head off every play. And then, uh, you know, the other brain in that, that book, in that chapter was actually mine, um, which, you know, I was a college baseball player and, you know, had a decent chance to go pro and had some scouts who liked me and did everything right physically. And, you know, it, come time to play, I just, I couldn't keep it together. I was having panic attacks, basically, and I uh, didn't really know why. And so that's kind of what started this whole process. But anyway, I was trying to figure out what made great athletes' brains great. And, you know, come to find out, I mean, mine was like that, but it doesn't have to be. And it's something that you can make better. I mean, it's, you know, Russell Wilson has some natural gifts mentally, um, but we can all, you know, it's very possible and feasible that even the worst brains, as far as staying home under pressure, can be trained to get better. So, uh, after doing your research, did you regret not trying psychedelic drugs to uh, fix your baseball career? <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'd say regret. Regret's a strong word. Um, you know, I'd really love to someday, uh, but hey, just the logistics and the legalities and having a wife and kid, it's just not, like, worth the risk of, like, having my life ruined, which is crazy that people's lives get ruined by drugs by being arrested, you know, over them and, and you know, thrown in a cage over, you know, trying to, you know, if you're trying to explore, you know, how to get better and all that. I mean, you know, uh, but no, I mean, it was, it's really cool because I really, really wanted to try everything in this book, but that was one, you know, I, it just wasn't something that I felt like I necessarily needed. I would love to, maybe, I mean, I still even would love one day, you know, just because, you know, it'd be cool, I think, to experience. Um, but, no, I not necessarily regret. Um, but I thought that, I mean, I thought that several people used them, and, you know, they, they just, they were so open about it, and I just learned so much from them. Like like uh, Kyle Kingsbury, the UFC fighter that did them and told me about them, and then you know other people that didn't end up in the book, but just learning from them, like it was you know it was just really just amazing, just just a good example of how many different possibilities I think there are out there. How important was the uh, involvement of the major corporations like Red Bull in uh, in the advancement of these technologies? Red Bull is uh, they're great because they've got so many athletes. Um, who are so willing to just kind of try anything to get better. Um, so they're able to kind of bring these companies in that are developing this technology and stuff and kind of have them try it out. And, um, you know, and I think that helps. That just kind of helps everybody, helps athletes, you know, have a new way to try to get better and see if something works for them. Because everything, I mean, different people are going to, different things are going to work better for different people. Um, so, you know, it's nice for them to be able to test stuff out. And then, I mean, you know, Nike had developed a lot of technology that they then stopped producing um, that some other guys then kind of picked up and ran with that used to work there and they left because they believed in it so much. That was uh, the uh, sensory performance technology stuff um, with strobe goggles and this like really in-depth eye vision test like on a touch screen, you know, with these really intense basically games you play to test your vision. And on and on, um, you know, guys just, you know, even if they're not gigantic corporations now, too, there are a lot of these companies starting this stuff up or that are in startup mode to start developing this stuff. And I think they impress me as much as the big corporations like Red Bull because they're not making that much money. They're pouring tons of money into this to try to make it happen. And it just really just shows me how much they really believe in this, which was in the, in the very beginning, that's kind of what convinced me that this was a real thing where you know, following up on as a book, because these people were quitting jobs at, I mean, one guy quit his job at Nike, he was an executive at Nike, making big bucks, and he quit it to start up this company to, to develop some of this tech, 
can, you know, get it out into the world. So, yeah, they definitely have to believe in him. And, I mean, you're not going to just leave a nice job like that just on a whim. Wow, that's that's impressive there. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are, like, very sane people, too. Like, this is a guy, like, very mild-mannered as a wife and kid. You know, wife stays at home, you know, with the kids. Like, and so, like, you know, I mean, he's a scientist, though. And he just he sees where it's going. He had spent, you know, several years working on this stuff. And he saw the results. And then Nike, you know, had their reasons. They shut it down. And so he wanted to go off and keep going with it. And so he made the jump. Um, you know, he's just one of several that have done stuff like that um, in this book. And I just, I, I admire the heck out of him. Because, yeah, I mean, there's a chance they could get rich off of it down the road. I mean, let's be honest. They're in it to make money. It's not like they're, you know, it's, it's, they're not you know, on a, on a, you know, impoverished, like, Saints Quest or something, but it's also amazing to me, like, that, you know, you've got this stability, but they believe in this so much that, um, they're willing to kind of put it all on the line for it. Nice. Do you feel that, like, yoga and, uh, the video game training that, uh, NASCAR does were kind of the, uh, the beginnings of, of some of these things being incorporated. You mentioned, of course, you know, that breathing is, you know, in huge in the, the you know, like with clutch and then using the technology with, uh, you know, the the video, the uh, racing simulators, uh, the, how they'll be incorporated into the future? Yeah, for sure. I mean, they already are starting to be. Um, you know, it's, and it's only going to keep progressing. I mean, because the technology is only going to get you know, more affordable, um, and it's only going to become more, it's just going to be more and more normalized, I think. And what was really cool to me is for all this high-tech stuff, too, as you mentioned, yoga, I mean, meditations in here, you know, visualization, self-talk, these kind of old-school, you know, self-help and psycho- psychological methods, you know, they're in there, and they're in there because modern science is starting to show us exactly what they do in the brain. I mean, there's physical stuff that neuroscientists are able to track now when people are meditating or praying or doing visualization and stuff, and they can track that in the brain now, and they see how it's having a real effect. So it's not this, like, nebulous idea anymore to meditate or to pray or whatever else you do psychologically. I mean, there's real physical things happening in the brain um, that show, I mean, this is real stuff. It really helps when it's done correctly. And that, to me, was as amazing as any of the technology. It's like, wow, I mean, these people from thousands of years ago, you know, came up with this, and they kind of knew something that the rest of us are only now kind of catching up to. You know what I mean? Very true. I mean, it, it's just impressive how it sometimes culture takes, you know, a large amount of time to, to change. With the... Uh, yeah. in- with the NFL Combine uh, recently going on, um, do you feel in the future that some of this technology is going to be incorporated in, say, the uh, like personnel decisions? Yeah, um, I mean, I think it already is, uh, kind of quietly. I mean, there's the uh, one of the uh, tools in the books called NeuroTracker. It's uh, basically you know a shell game where you cover you know a rock or something with a cup, and you got three cups, and you got to move it all around, and you got to follow it. Like, it's like that, except super high tech <laughs> on steroids, like in 3D. And you got to track three or four balls among uh, seven or eight flying around. And then, you know, it's got all different speeds. And then you can layer in other things in the background to follow along as well. And so athletes are training with it that was developed by, you know, really smart people up at the University of Montreal. And now that is finding its way into the NFL Combine. I know they've used it before. I, I'm not sure if they're using it again this year, but it does kind of what they want the Wonder Lake to do in a lot of ways as far as testing cognitive processing ability and, and intelligence and that kind of thing because it's really hard to do. Like it's, it's insanely hard. And so, yeah, I mean, they're using that as just one example um, to kind of test guys. And uh, I definitely think we're going to see more and more of this. It's going to get really interesting really quickly because it's one thing to have guys, I think, like, kind of, I mean, it's basically playing a video game. It's scientifically engineered and all that, but, I mean, it's they are performing. Where it's going to get really interesting is, you know, whether they start asking guys to hook their brains up to these EEG technologies that can read their brain waves and on and on because you can learn a lot about somebody really quickly doing that. But it's a very, like, moral and probably legal gray area too because I mean, that's getting into medical territory and all that so it's, that's going to be really interesting to see what they start trying to do with all that
Definitely. Um, do you have any other books that are coming down the pipeline? Anything you're currently working on? Uh, staying busy with my work. I'm a writer at large for VR Mag. Uh, Bleach Report's new online uh, magazine. Doing, you know, they're all about smart, good storytelling. So that's really fun. And um, uh, working on possibly starting a podcast for Head in the Game. I'm going to start. You know, I've got a website for Head in the Game. It's Head in the Game Book dot com and Head in the Game Blog dot com. We're going to start doing more with this, just because I just I'm not ready to be done with it yet. Um, I think it's just really. Fascinating. I do think it is the future um, of, you know, performance. And, you know, it's just a really cool way, I think, to also kind of try just to get better as people. Um, so I'm going to keep running with that. As far as other books, i got a few ideas uh, I've been talking to my agent about, but nothing in stone yet, so probably shouldn't say. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, just always looking for the next good story, you know. 